Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Mitchell Berger, uh, who is SVP of Global Commerce at Crunchyroll. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk to, to Mitchell today because Crunchyroll is one of the most interesting and most really underreported uh, stories, I think, in the business of Hollywood right now. Uh, you know, they, I think folks every every few months are, you know, they're surprised that another anime movie has debuted to 20 or 30 million dollars at the box office. What's going on? Why is this happening? Uh, so I wanted to get Mitchell on to talk about that uh, and and talk a little bit about, you know, activating these kind of niche core groups of fans and just how the business model works on their end, because everybody kind of understands how a big blockbuster movie works. Uh, I think fewer people understand how this sort of thing works. So, Mitchell, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the history of Crunchyroll and Funimation and how they kind of came together and uh, and and how we got to a place where you guys can open a movie like Dragon Ball Super Superhero to $20 million and shock the world every three months. <laughs> Great. So it's definitely been a, a long and winding road to get here. It's been a fun journey. Uh, you know, both Funimation and Crunchyroll were very active in the uh, in the anime space for quite some time. You know, I think uh, Funimation was in the space for 25 plus years. Crunchyroll been around for quite some time. Uh, what really, I think, kind of started to bring things together, not only the advent of streaming, which I think grew both businesses uh, pretty substantially, but really it was about Sony, um, who came in, I want to say it's four years ago now, could be wrong with the date, uh, but acquired Funimation, so brought them into the the Sony family. Uh, and Sony has a you know rich history in Japan, obviously, has a rich history with anime, um, and really, I think, understands the space in a very unique way. So they, they got into that space with uh, Funimation. Last year, they completed the acquisition of Crunchyroll, so we're able to bring both of those together, along with some other acquisitions internationally. And, and really, I think what they're doing is trying to, to build a really great place to service anime fans on a global basis. You know, they, they looked at the space. They understand how popular it is with those fans, what the opportunity is there, and really wanted to, uh, to lean into that. And they've done that. And I think that really is what set us up in large part to to show the successes that we've shown now across all of our omni-channel businesses, including theatrical. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, too, because Sony, you know, Sony is kind of uh, among the major studios. Sony is the one that has kind of said, you know, streaming, not necessarily for us. We're going to get away from from Crackle or we're going to you know, we're going to we're not going to do the, the video store on PlayStation. But Crunchyroll is a huge hit, uh, like a huge, huge streaming hit. Um, which is really interesting to me uh, in terms of, um, you know, how do how what was it that they saw uh, it, it, with you guys and and Funimation and everything else that made them think like, OK, here's a here's a niche that we can uh, that we can we can jump in and kind of activate and dominate. I think it really starts and ends with the fans. I mean, that really is the the value here. We have such a dedicated and passionate fan base um, on a global basis. And it, it really, if you look over the last 5, 10, 15 years and the, the growth of anime, the evolution of anime, it's a it's a fairly major force right now, especially with with younger media consumers. They're very, very passionate about it. You know, I you know, for example, myself, I've worked in the in the movie business my entire career. My children never cared what I did until the day I started working in anime. And suddenly they were like, wow, that's kind of cool. And let's talk about this. And can I go to the office? Can I see how they dub stuff? You know, and that was a real eye-opening moment for me where you you see how important it is to this segment of fans and how passionate they are. And, you know, when, when we talk about theatrical, and I'm sure we'll delve into it, you know, part of that success is because they are passionate and want to come together as a community. I think Sony saw that and recognized the power of that community of interest there amongst anime fans and thought they, should, they could bring something very powerful to the party there, and they, they have. They've really helped us globalize this and bring anime to an incredibly wide audience. Yeah, let's talk Let's talk about the fandom a little bit, because, I, you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me is the Expo, the Crunchyroll Expo, which, you know, is, uh, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how to kind of parse these things out in terms of size, you know, when in my head it's like, okay, you've got San Diego Comic-Con and then kind of everything else. But I assume you've been to the expo. Yeah, you've been you've yes. you've, you've uh, interacted with the fans. What is that? What is that like? What is it? What is that feeling of community like when you're there? I, I'll tell you, if you if you want to understand anime, there's no better way to do it than to go to an anime convention because you get this fully immersive experience. And 
you know, whether you're an anime fan or not, I think what you understand when you go with a kind of an open mind into a, a, an expo is the passion that people have. You're in this space with tens of thousands of people who all share this love of this medium that called anime. They're doing cosplay. They're buying. Th- they're you know buying goods. They're buying merchandise. They're going to panels. They're talking with each other. They're meeting up. A lot of times they're meeting people in real life for the first time that they've been working uh, and and communicating with online all this time that shares this fandom. So it's this real sense of of community and festival and sharing and belonging. It, it, it's just it's it's amazing. And what I really take away from it as a you know a, a lifelong media consumption person is the passion. Like these, these fans just live and breathe and love anime. Um, it helps in some ways to find who they are. It helps them find folks they share interests with. And it's just this powerful force of bringing people together. And when you go to the conventions, you kind of get immersed in that and you can't help but feel the value that anime is bringing to this entire community. That it's a really interesting point that you make about uh, people wanting to come together and and you know experience and celebrate this stuff together in person, which I think obviously is a big reason why the the, the theatrical uh, mm-hmm. releases have been such a huge success. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. When you are uh, when you when you're sitting around in the office and you're trying to figure out, okay, this is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna put on streaming. This is what we're gonna put on. Uh, you know, Fathom events. This is what we're going to do a Fathom event for. And this is what we're going to do a wide release kind of more traditional uh, distribution for. How do you guys sit down and break that out? I think it starts with, you know, I'll say this as a starting point of how we go through that selection process. We at Crunchyroll and Sony uh, as well are big believers in the theatrical experience. So when you look at when we get films, we really believe in that communal theatrical experience. I mean, look, there's nothing like seeing a film on the big screen. I think I, I know that you know that I'm assuming your listeners feel that way. It's a special kind of event, and we really want to bring that to our fans. So from a theatrical standpoint, we want to look at every opportunity we can to give them that experience. And then I also think that uh, that community part is something around it. And when you look at anime fans, they love to come together. They love to share their passion. They love to talk. They love to debate. They love to experience things together. And doing that in a theater, there's just nothing like it. There, there is nothing like sitting in a darkened theater with 200 or 300 people who share your passion, watching something that you love and experiencing together in real time. That just can't be replicated anywhere else. And we really believe in that experience. So we try to bring that to them as often as we can. Yeah. So again, like in, in, um, how do you how do you guys decide like which of the the movies or shows will be the best to create that experience? So uh, so a lot of it comes from when we can acquire content. So all of the content that we release, we acquire with partnerships from licensors in Japan. So they are looking at content, whether it's an extension of a show, original content, things like that, with an eye towards you know what is going to work from a theatrical experience. We then work with those licensors as those movies are made or in production to acquire the rights to distribute them, uh, you know, for whatever suite of territories we get, whether it's globally outside of Japan, like we're going to have with uh, Suzume that's coming up next year, uh, like we have with Dragon Ball, whether it's some subset of that. We work with them to identify films that we think are appealing, that are quality films, that are something that fans are going to love. We then acquire the rights and then we work on a distribution plan based on territory, based on demand, based on opportunity to bring it to theaters where we can. Yeah. I, do you guys ever worry a little bit about uh, about piracy? Because I know, you know, when I, I mentioned I, I, I was talking about going to see Dragon Ball in the theater mm-hmm. with, you know, with, with somebody, which I did uh, this, this weekend. And it was uh, fun. It's always it's, you know, uh, as somebody who grew up. You know, full, this is me being personal. Uh, grew up watching uh, Dragon Ball on my TV as a you know fourteen, fifteen year old. Uh, seeing it on the big screen is a very different um, sort of experience and very you know kind of amusing and fun. Um, but there, there, you know, some people did say like uh, you know the the uh, one reason the gross isn't higher than it is is because it's been out in Japan for a couple of months. You know, the people people have pirated it. It's we're 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 losing revenue that way. What, do you guys ever worry about that when you're making these deals? Sure. Piracy is always a concern. I think that piracy is a concern for, for media in general across the board. It's definitely a concern in the anime space. Um, when, when we look at it, look, we, we do everything we can to make sure that we're giving people a safe, legal, you know, uh, value-conscious way to consume content. I think that's where you have to start to give people those options. 
For us, it's really about ultimately wanting to make sure that we're supporting the creators in Japan. You know, so much of the creation of anime in Japan, um, it is a, a wonderful industry. It's a labor of love. Um, but we want to make sure that those creators and those artists in Japan get rewarded for the amazing content that they create. So for us, it really is about making sure that we do the best job we can to bring it out there, to give you this big screen experience for theatrical specifically, but also make sure that fans understand that, look, by by supporting those legal ways, by going to a theater and seeing a movie like Dragon Ball, you're supporting those artists and those creators back in Japan. And that in turn allows them to create even more of the amazing anime that you want. And I think that's important for the industry and important for the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm. I, I haven't talked to anybody who has worked closely with Fathom before, which is a is a business model I find. Uh, I find really interesting because it. You know, it, it, everybody thinks of big theatrical releases like, oh, you've got the massive ad campaigns, and but Fathom is more targeted, and it does it, it in a more in a, a slightly more limited um, uh, sense. And I don't mean limited in terms of small. I just mean limited in terms of like you're doing one or two nights and that's that's you got to get people out for that um, for that thing. What is it like working with them uh, both just in terms of like the actual pure mechanics of distribution? Because, you know, I like in terms of making ensuring image quality and all that sort of stuff, but also just in terms of like getting the word out there that, hey, we've got a we got an event coming up you got to go see it yeah so so at crunchyroll we do those events directly ourselves um so okay. we do our, everything direct ourselves whether it's an event style release or a traditional wide release um and we've built up that capability over the last eight years or so from the theatrical business and when we started the division what we really focus on is when we look at a film uh you know every film has an audience and every film has a scale that it can support um and that changes over time that changes by property it changes by time of year those kind of things so we spend a lot of time understanding what the fan base is for the film, what the opportunity is for distribution. And then we will evaluate, you know, where do we want to go? One of the things that we've done a lot of uh, that we started with Dragon Ball Broly and Dragon Ball Resurrection F is working with our exhibition partners on a hybrid model. So traditionally, if I go back eight years ago, most anime films were released on this event style release where it was three, five, seven days, but it's, you know, one showing a day, it's appointment kind of viewing, it's you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday matinee, those kind of things. And that work that helped us build an audience, I think it helped ex- exhibitors understand and, and see the value of those anime fans that we could bring into the theaters. So as we have scaled this business, what we did for a while was really look at a hybrid model where we run a event style release um, and we put it out there, we, we do market to that. But what we've told exhibitors is look, If there's demand, if you see advanced ticket sales are going through the roof, if you see that, you know, fans are are really buying out the screens and you know there's capacity for more, you know you can run it for a full run for the week, do it. We the last thing that we want to do is constrain the supply and the access in the market to those films. Not every screen, not every city, not every town in the US can can bear a full run. It doesn't always make sense. But there are anime fans there, and we want to make sure that we have those opportunities to play, even if it is just one or two nights. What we've seen now over the last, uh, you know, say four years or so, is there's much more demand now for a full run. There, the anime has definitely grown. I think exhibitors have seen the value of that fan base and how we can bring them in. So we are, you know, still doing event style releases, but we're also doing wider releases. You know, the, the, the release that we just did of Dragon Ball Super Superhero was a, a fairly wide footprint. We had a great distribution across, uh, you know, I think it was, was close to 4,000 screens. Yeah. That's a testament to the fan base. That's a testament to, to exhibitors believing in us, what we do. And then it's, you know, us marketing and making sure that we can get fans into the theaters on opening weekend. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about the relationship with exhibitors a little bit because it is, it is an interesting time in the world of theatrical uh, distribution and the theatrical model. Right. I mean, I like, For instance, uh, this, you know, there's a National Cinema Day is coming up on September 3rd, right? And there are $3 tickets for any showing in any format, which is all well and good, except for the fact that, you know, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old, three-year-old and a seven-year-old now, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, my seven-year-old, um, uh, three-year-old and the seven-year-old, and there's nothing in the theater. There's nothing to take them to in the theaters, really, you know, except for DC League of Super Pets. I, they're, they're still probably too young to see Dragon Ball, like doesn't 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 quite work for them. Um, 
the lack of product is is very striking right now. And you guys are creating a product that is not only, you know, I mean, it is product, but it's a product that has a real built in fan base. Mm -hmm. Um, And how have the exhibitors reacted to that uh, from from your POV? I mean, are you seeing more uh, more requests for movies? Are you seeing more uh, more requests for longer, longer plays? What are what are you seeing from them? I think two things I would say. One, the, the, the most exciting thing for me is we're, we're not having to spend as much time educating people on what anime is and convincing them that it matters. I think that the exhibition community in general has seen the performance of things like Demon Slayer or My Hero or Dragon Ball, and they understand what that demand is there. Um, and there's there's a, a history now, you know, one or two of these films is kind of a, an interesting uh, one off. But after we have three or four of these, it's a trend. And I think that they appreciate what anime is and where it sits in the theatrical community now. So it's great for us that we're not having to convince people as much anymore the value of anime. We can talk more about, OK, what does it make sense? How can we make this bigger? How can we promote market together? How can we make this as as big as possible? I think that's that's great. And then from our perspective, we are looking at you know how much content can we bring to the to the theater? What's the right number? What can we do to make sure that fans have something to come see when they want to? But we always want to make sure it's a good experience. We want to make sure that it's good quality films that we market it well. That it's 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 something that that delivers on that promise of a theatrical experience. Um, but I will say the exhibitor community has been amazing and are great partners for us. I mean, they've really worked for us and grown this business again over the last seven or eight years. Um, and it's a big testament to them because there were times when, you know, we were building this business that we had to get people to take a leap of faith, had to get them to trust us, had to try some things out to prove that, yes, fans will show up on a Tuesday afternoon and see something. But they did it. And then they came back and every success begets a little bit more success and a little bit more opportunity. Yeah. So uh, in terms of your release schedule over the next uh, next year or so here, in terms how many titles are you guys looking to do um, both event style and and wider? So if you know, if you if you've already got it planned out, you know, yes, (laughs) we we have a a little bit. I mean, we've got, I think, four or so films that are either dated or we've announced that are coming, you know, between, say, now and April. I know we've uh, we've announced that. Uh, Susan May is coming early next year, which is uh, Shinkai's new film out of Japan. Uh, we we're going to have a One Piece film later, uh, I think, in a couple of months. There's a few things that are coming along the way. You know, we're we're not in the same situation because we acquire all of our content. I don't always have firm dates three years out. You know, I wish I could announce yeah. uh, you know phase six of what I'm doing. <laughs> it's just it's just a different business model. So we we are yeah. you know, sometimes opportunistic, but I think what is I can say with with clarity is. The flow of content coming out of Japan theatrically is as good as it's ever been. And I think we're going to have a lot of amazing opportunities over the next 12, 18 months and beyond to keep a steady flow of content coming to theaters, to keep things there that fans want to see. And honestly, for exhibitors to also have something that we know people are going to come to month after month after month that we know we can open. So I don't have a ton of specific dates and specific titles, but I can tell you we're going to have a regular cadence of films, and we're we're really excited and bullish on the theatrical experience. So we're going to be leaning into it. Yeah, I you know it's interesting looking at news about theatrical and, and distribution and everything because it's always it's always bad news. Everybody talks about you know bad. It's all it's always bad, and then sometimes you get uh, you know the last for the last month or so I've read nothing but stories about a24 the you know successful indie, indie distributor a24 and I love a24 I I watch a24 movies are great but it it's it's a small scale success and the way I kind of crystallized that recently just to myself was look the Dragon Ball super superheroes opening would make it the 10th highest grossing a24 t- film of all time that's in one weekend in one weekend they did that and I'm, I'm just curious from your perspective as somebody in the company have you have you been noticing more people paying attention to this? Are you still uh, f- uh, feeling kind of ignored? I, I I just feel like this is a big story in a world where theatrical is in some amount of trouble. Here's something that is coming along to help it. And nobody's really talking about it. <laughs> it's a great question. I think we, we don't we don't sit here and I think worry about being ignored. I think when you look at what we've done to a large degree, it speaks to itself. I mean, it speaks for itself. And 
really for me, what what I take away from and what I would love to see is I think it's very validating for the fans. You know, anime fans for years and years and years um, have been passionate about what they do. It's not always been mainstream. Um, you know, it's it, it's an interesting journey as an anime fan. There are definitely some huge mainstream hits. There's a lot that are, are a little bit below the mainstream. But what we've seen is anime is becoming more mainstream every single day. And I think this theatrical experience is a great way, you know, when you when you see Dragon Ball Super Superhero being talked about in major media outlets and people in Hollywood talking about the opening, in a lot of ways it helps validate as a fan, like, hey, this thing that I love is 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 being talked about in broader pop culture. And that's a fun feeling. That's a really cool feeling as a fan to say, yeah, I've been on this for, for years. I love this. Now people are seeing just how amazing this is. Um, that's what, what really I focus on and what's, what's great for me is helping the fans see that love come to fruition and other people see it and understand it and then bring them in. You know, the, what's the, I think the other great thing about the last two weeks of Dragon Ball and then the films before it is every time one of these things hits and it becomes a topic of conversation for a while, people who aren't in the anime space hear about it. And some of those people are like, wow, I, I should really go check that out. Like, oh, I want to see what. What is so special about Dragon Ball? Why are everybody going to see a Demon Slayer? Like, I've never heard of this thing. What is it? And it gives us this great opportunity to expose new people to the medium. And that is, I think, the magic of what goes on. Look, when you, when you take a step back and you look at anime, I think a lot of folks want to talk about anime as a genre. Um, and it's really not. It's a medium. It is a way of storytelling. It's a visual style. It's a, it's a storytelling style. It is a medium that artists use. And within that medium... You've got every genre that you can imagine. You've got action films. You've got dramas. You've got, you know, slice of life and really emotional character-driven studies. So there's something for everybody within that medium of anime. And we have these moments when people outside the community are talking about it. They get curious and come in. And if, if you'll come in and look at it, I guarantee you, you can find something that you'll like and appreciate what, uh, what the artist and the creators are bringing to the, to the table. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mitchell, I want to ask a possibly not a personal question, but I, I'm just curious from your perspective as somebody who uh, I, I just found out before this started, you, you're you actually based in Dallas. Correct. You are based in Dallas. So I am based in Dallas. There are not a lot of, uh, you know, film TV oriented people based in Dallas. It's yeah. it's a I, I'm curious from your perspective, what it's like just working uh, as a uh, film studio distribution executive in Dallas, trying to trying to do all this stuff, you know, mostly on the coasts. Mm -hmm. uh, what 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 is your day to day like? What do you when you wake up? Do you have a call in New York City uh, and then a call in L.A. immediately after that? How does it how does it work for you? I think like everybody, I wake up, I get on Zoom, I stay on Zoom until I <laughs> take a break to eat, and then you know maybe at some point I can take a nap. That that's the world that I think we all live in a little bit. It, it's actually it's great. Like I love living in Dallas. It's it's a wonderful place. And, and I love I love being there. What's amazing about us now in Crunchyroll, and again, as Sony has brought us together, is we've really become a global company. You know, and it's it's a time now where I can have a call, I can have a meeting at any time of day. We're talking with our European team, we're talking with our team in Japan, in Australia, in Latin America, here in the U.S. There's always somebody on and working. Um, so, in in large part, yes, I'm based in Dallas, but we're working as a as a global entity. So between travel, between, you know, video calls and things like that. It, it's, a, it's a great time to be in the business because I think you can uh, you can connect with people. It, it's funny, I, as a, a personal story, we were talking as, after the pandemic hit and we all, you know, spent every, every single meeting on Zoom and all those kind of things. In a strange way, it actually brought us much closer together with our international teams because we were all on equal footing. There's something about everybody being on a screen that yes, it's, it's not personal, it's not connected, but the team in Australia, the team in London, and the team in the U.S. all together on a call, you blur those boundaries. Then you're not, you're not as, as cognizant of where someone is, except you know the guy in Australia. It's it's two a.m. in the morning. He's a little bleary eyed, but it, it helps you bring it together and really operate as a cohesive global company. I love that. Absolutely love that part of it. And you know, you know I travel a lot. You know, go go here, there, and yonder. But you know, the work is what the work is, and and we can get it done from wherever we are. So, yeah, it feels like the modern motto right there. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I always like to I always like to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked. Uh, if there's anything you think 
folks should know about Crunchyroll, the distribution of anime, you know, anything about anything about this entire world or, or something else entirely unrelated. If there's just something you <laughs> think folks well, should know a, about. A wide open blank page to, to write upon there. Um, look, the only thing I would say is, you know, as I as I mentioned earlier, I think anime is is something special. It is it is a community. It is it is fan based? And really, when I look at what our job is here, um, you know, a lot of media companies and a lot of I think creators in general, they're trying to figure out a way to be everything uh, or something to everyone. Like you're, you're trying to crash the wide net. You really want to be something to everyone to, to find an audience. What's different about us is we're really focused on being everything to someone. That that's the magic for us. And if if I can figure out a way that someone sitting in a theater in the the middle of Texas on a Friday night and they're with 200 friends and they're watching Dragon Ball and in that moment that movie is everything to them and they can share this moment with friends and it brings just a sliver of happiness into their life then that's what we're here to do. And I will consider that a success with that. I think is our, our North star, everything else just makes sense. It it is about bringing stuff to those fans. And as long as we keep those fans firmly in mind and what we're doing is about the fan, I think the sky's the limit, whether it's theatrical or selling home video or selling uh, licensed goods or the streaming service, it's all oriented around, that fandom. And that's why I love being here. That's what gets me up every morning. That's what gets me excited. That's why I still love my job every single day. Well, let me, I, I, let me just ask one follow up on that. Uh, it's something I'm very interested in just in general. Uh, and I, I don't actually know about from your, from your guys POV. So maybe this is a dumb question. Um, but in terms of physical media sales, home video mm-hmm. sales, um, are you guys still, uh, you know, uh, committed to the reality of Blu-ray, 4K, DVD. What what is what what does that look like from your guys' end? Very very much so. And I would tell you, our physical business is is pretty healthy, all things considered, especially globally. Um, you know, U.S., uh, Germany, France, Australia, UK. There's a lot of great markets out there. Um, we're we're a big believer in the the what we call the omni-channel business or 360 or whatever the buzzword is today. But it's this mm-hmm. entire lifestyle. Um, And again, it gets back to the fans. I talk about the fans a lot, but it really all does come back to the fans. For us, I think what's interesting is, and and I've I've worked in in physical media a a good chunk of my career, so it's near and dear to my heart. A lot of physical media is about buying a package to watch a film. Like you're you're buying a Blu-ray because you want to watch the film at home because you didn't go to the theater, you want to see it. That's great. There's There's a wonderful market for that. For us, we've got these passionate fans. It's about collecting. So it's Mm -hmm. not necessarily about buying the Blu-ray to watch the show, to watch the movie. Yes, that's part of it, but it's about the packaging. It's about the extras. It's about this way that, that as a collector, and I'm a, I'm a big collector of all things, books, CDs, vinyl, comic books. Like I, I've got a storage space full of toys. Like I could go on an episode of hoarders at this point. I love physical, I love physical things as a collector. and, And a lot of our fans are collectors. It's having a shelf and being able to put something up there that shows and talks about your fandom. It's a way to express your fandom of the show. That's why our physical business is healthy. And I think it's going to be healthy for a while. That, that collectible mentality is really, really key. And, and we're really leaning into that and feeding that. Um, we, could, we could spend another whole hour talking about what we're doing there. And maybe we should at some point. It's, it's a great business. And rumors of its demise are far, far overblown. I would love to do another hour on physical media. We can do it in front of my, I mean, you can see the books behind me, but I got old Blu-ray shelf over there that we can, awesome. we can, we can do it in front of, uh, cause this is, again, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm a big believer in the, uh, idea. And I, and I'm, I love to see, I love to see companies like country roll that manage to merge all of these different viewing formats into a successful business. I mean, streaming is, should obviously be mm-hmm. a component of any studio's, plan going forward but you know so should theatrical and so should home video sales that's you can make money with all of them yeah Uh, i'll I'll add one last thing and then i'll because i get going for hours on this the way i look at it is if you're a fan of a show a piece of content um you're going to want to then go so let's just say you're streaming a show you become a fan you're going to want to go out into the real world in your real life and intersect with that you're going to want to buy goods you're going to want to buy this and go to a theater and all those kind of things Wherever that fan wants to go interact with that content to express their fandom, 
I want us to be there. I want us to be there with them with an authentic Crunchyroll experience that says, hey, if you want to buy some action figures to put on your shelf, here's an option. You want to buy a Blu-ray box set? Here it is. You want to go to the theater and see it? Here it is. We want to be everywhere that that fan is to go along the journey with them and give them a way to express that fandom. That's great. That is great. Uh, Mitchell, I really appreciate you being on the show uh, today. Uh, and everybody should go check out uh, Dragon Ball Super, Superhero. It's in theaters right now. Uh, sign up for uh, a, a streaming membership at Crunchyroll. Uh, you can do it all. Uh, it's a, it's an exciting time. Exciting time out there. Uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. And I will be back next week with another episode of Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. See you guys then. Thank you.